this in this session just a reminder that uh, uh, we will have a, we will have a, say a time for questions and discussion after the two talks by uh, our speakers today we are going to start with uh, with Lars Matson uh, who is uh, talking uh, about the importance of gas dust drift in AGB winds so come on Lars you can start uh, i will let you know when two minutes are left right can you see my slides yes everything is all right okay well first of all thank you for inviting me uh, my intention here is to give a talk where i illustrate my intellectual journey that i made to conclude that separation of uh, gas and dust is the key to everything uh, in particularly in modeling, and not least dust-driven winds of ADB stars, but I will get back to that. Um, no, I don't, oh, like that. So here's the outline. I will start by discussing the role of dust in the cosmic matter cycle, and then go on to the dynamics of interstellar gas and dust. And hopefully I will be able to say something uh, conclusive about drift in dusty stellar outflows, ADB winds in particular. So, um, cosmic dust cycle. Uh, dust is an essential component in the cosmic matter cycle. Uh, originally formed in stars, dust grains are processed, grown as well as destroyed in the ISM, and about half of all metals are in dust grains. So the dynamics of the dust is crucial for where the, dust, uh, for where the metals actually end up in the ISM, and then they're also in stars, as we will see. Uh, a lot is still unknown about the dust, how dust grains form, um, the role they play in the chemical evolution of the interstellar medium. But heterogeneous chemistry can help to explain the production rates of molecular hydrogen and explain the diversity of molecular species that exist in the interstellar medium. And by understanding this gust, das, uh, gust, dust gas interactions, we can perhaps answer some questions regarding ISM and ISM chemistry. Dust affects and is affected by hydrodynamical turbulence, the heating, the cooling, um, radiated transfer, and the ISM chemistry. So one important arrow is also missing here in this plot. And there's one to add here, which is basically the connection between the hydrodynamics and the dust screens, the dust gas interaction, dynamically speaking. Uh, I'd like to mention also that there is some uh, ice growing on dust grains. Um, uh, you form ice mantles because the dust uh, temperatures can go down to about 10 Kelvin. And there's also some uh, physical processes related to this, like sublimation and photodesorption and stuff like that. But let's move on to the uh, dynamical part. Uh, decoupling of, of gas and dust has to do with drag forces and the equation of motion. Um, and the inertia uh, that dust grains possess. Assuming position coupling, as we are some very often do in uh, simulations uh, between the gas and the dust, such that you can have a one fluid treatment, uh, that is actually the same as to deny the existence of inertia, which doesn't make sense. But we do it anyway. Uh, the motion of dust is governed by the relative velocity of the uh, end of friction time scale, also known as the stopping time. And um, it also, it, that stopping time depends on the grain size, the bulk material density, as well as the gas properties. So, and what we see here is that large grains will uh, clearly uh, decouple from the turbulent flow and this happens on the uh, scales of uh, molecular clouds as shown by Hopkins and Lee in 2016. The figure uh, on the slide is a high resolution 2D simulation of gas dust dynamics, where it's clear that uh, dust form clusters and fractal structures not seen in the gas. Um, the velocity field is also different, I should say. But this is 2D and reality is to 3D, of course. And Hopkins and Lee indeed ran some uh, 3D simulations as well, but only in low, low resolution and with a limited number of inertial dust particles. So here is a 3D simulation with the same resolution as the previous 2D simulation and millions of uh, dust particles in it. And uh, the small scale cluster 
string of the dust grains here is quite obvious, I would say. And the very large uh, particles also uh, show no clustering in these simulations, and the smallest are basically following the flow as, a, as a, one would expect because of the low inertia. And that was just gas drag, but of course there are external forces acting on the grains as well. And one of the most obvious ones to add is self-gravity from the carrier, the, the, the stellar gas. Uh, so here is self-gravity from a nearly genes unstable gas, um, which adds another term in the equation of motion. And then the, there is now competition between you know, gas drag and the gravitational background created by the gas. For small and large grains, uh, which is, is shown by the upper and the lower um, panels to the right, um, there is no qualitative difference really between these two cases. But for the more intermediate sized grains and middle panels, there is a huge difference as you can see uh, in what happens to the grains. Um, the speeds are uh, of the large grains uh, depicted by the blue lines and, and the speed distributions in the left panel. Um, the speeds increase substantially by adding gravity, in fact, and uh, other external forces could do the same thing. So decoupling plus external forces can change everything in principle. And removing metals via dust can alter the compositions of uh, new stars. Here's an example from uh, work by Hopkins and Conroy based on the simulations, by, the simulations by Hopkins and Lee. Adding dust gas separation seems to explain uh, the abundance patterns of, for example, this star with a wonderful name of CS29498-043. Um, and you can also see that the variance uh, is explained, the general variance seen in the stars. Low, low middle list, for example. And uh, if we consider a gene's unstable case, like a protostellar collapse, um, we see a similar trend. Small grains follow the gas in the collapse quite well because the basically drag uh, is dominating, while large grains fall to the center much faster and will be, get astrated, incorporated in the star. Really large grains even form disks, which is perhaps what we would expect um, because there are in fact planets out there. And speaking about planets, uh, the impressive results obtained with ALMA confirms the formation of rings and gaps in planetary disks, which is to a great extent the result of gas dust drift and external forces such as gravity and radiation pr pressure in combination. Planet formation can also affect the total interstellar dust budget, as shown by Forgan et al., uh, but only to a certain degree. But there is an effect that is non negligible, I would say. And as we're speaking about planet formation, uh, it should be pointed out that the type of clustering that we see in our ISM simulations. Um, it was actually first seen in simulations of planetary disks and even predicted uh, analytically back in the 70s for, in the planetary setting. But, that, but this is a um, phenomenon that is seen uh, in many places, in fact. So that leads me to um, this thing, the T800. Um, that realizing how uh, by the way, the T800, I'm going to, if, if you're interested in why we call our new code the, the T800, you can ask me later, by the way. But anyway, I'm going to explain this now. Realizing how different um, dust um, and gas must behave, I also realized that my PhD thesis on dust-driven stellar winds is a bundle of nonsense, basically. Drift is the key to everything, and I have I, I mean, I, I struggled to find excuses for myself and for others uh, when I was writing my PhD thesis to uh, not have drift included. Um, and uh, by over the years, I learned that this was basically not, not a viable uh, assumption to do the position coupling stuff. But fortunately, I learned um, to know this guy, um, Kirsty Sandin who had silently been working on the drift problem for many, many years and had an almost working simulation code. Um, the first dynamical atmosphere simulation code 
that could handle time-dependent RHD, dust formation, drift, and frequency-dependent radiated transfer with correct boundary condition and correct numerics and everything. And we teamed up and got, um, decided to finalize this code and that became the T800 code, which is now um, published in, in a principle available. Uh, the physical mechanism behind dust driven winds, just to remind you, uh, is that you have radiation pressure on dust grains, which then drag the gas along creating an outflow. If the gas and the dust is treated as um, one fluid, um, having position coupling them, uh, then the drag force is zero by definition because there's no drift velocity. In principle, that means there's zero drag force. No drag, well, that would mean no outflow in principle. So there's some kind of inconsistency here. Um, the position coupling approximation cannot be derived physically, in fact, and it's applicable only in a small region of parameter space. And this is something that's really important to remember. So when we ran our simulations with this new code, including drift effects, um, and produced a small grid of models for carbon-rich ADB stars, um, which is published in Sandina Mutsen in 2020. Um, we saw that various properties of the stellar wind models correlate with the drift factor, which is defined as the ratio of the um, gas velocity and the, no, sorry, the, the dust velocity and the gas uh, velocity. But most notably, there is a, there's little correlation between the mass loss rates with and without um, drift, which is the lower panel to the left, I think. Yes. Um, we can also see that um, in general, the mass loss rates uh, we find is limited by, our, limited by our models would be something in range between 10 to minus seven to 10 to minus five solar masses per year, which is very much consistent with the obs observed range, in fact. So even if everything is different, we're still in the right ballpark, so consistent with the observation. If you want to know more about uh, this code and, and these results, I encourage you to have a look at Krista Sandin's five minute talk. Uh, it's um, five minutes, very well spent. I can promise you that. So please go and check out the YouTube channel, and look at his talk. If you are interested in the really gory details, um, then uh, check out the paper and even the uh, actual data, which is in the Zenodo repository. Now, I promised in the abstract that I would say something about uh, drift uh, in, stellar in the stellar evolution context and, and the stellar evolution modeling and dust formation in stellar evolution models. So if drift is crucial for wind formation, it is also important for dust formation. Dust yields or dust yield calculations, I should say, uh, with stellar evolution codes are usually based on a stationary wind model that takes mass loss rate as input and calculate grain growth using uh, equations of the form displayed here on the slide. Um, adding drift, we must replace the gas velocity with a uh, dust velocity, which is higher, remember, remember that, and then modify the growth term so that the uh, you have the dependence on uh, the drift velocity included in the, in the growth rate. And sometimes it turns out that um, the, this, um, the effect of the drift is actually larger than the um, effect of thermal motion of the gas, which is usually what you have in this term, by the way. Two minutes left. Thank you, uh, I'm soon be done. Uh, the effect of drift turns out to be considerable, in fact, uh, when you look at this in more detail. Uh, but we only have preliminary results yet, so um, I'll get back to that some other time, I hope. Anyway, um, we can calculate the effect of drift from a parametrical, parametrical point of view uh, by introducing uh, a drift velocity, um, sorry, the, the ratio of the drift velocity to the thermal velocity and the gas velocity to the same. Um, but you can then show that there's a regime where the grain growth uh, increases considerably, which is the red 
uh, area in this plot. But there's also um, one where the growth rate is significantly reduced, which, which is the blue one. And then in, in between the um, denoted by the black line here, there is this sort of line of no effect. So the, you could also have a case where you simply have no effect of adding drift in principle. Um, this example is, by the way, for uh, C-rich chemistry. And if you would do it for uh, oxygen-rich, it would be slightly different, but not totally different, I would say. There's also a nice little analytical little expression, uh, approximation for this that you can use in order to uh, figure out whether um, uh, drift is going to enhance or decrease the rate, uh, the growth rate. So that brings me to my concluding remarks. And uh, instead of drawing conclusions, uh, I will make my concluding remarks in the form of a um, bunch of questions, which I think that deserves further discussion, some attention. Um, in particular, I would um, I would I would emphasize here on what we could expect from a full 3D simulation of an AGB wind, including drift, where the grains cluster um, in the winds, and how, would it change anything of the outflow uh, um, properties when you go from 1D models to 3D models? I'm, I'm pretty excited about thinking about this because I learned. Um, about the importance of the dust gas decoupling from doing 3D stuff. So when we now went back to doing 1D, uh, we saw also that the degrees of freedom seems to matter quite a lot. So I think this is an important question. But there are also other things like, um, how would the ADB uh, dust yields be affected in stellar evolution uh, modeling if you add drift? And can decoupling of dust and gas even affect the way stars evolve on the uh, AGB, I mean, when you simulate the evolution, that is. And of course, also, um, how is the chemical evolution um, uh, altered by separating um, gas and dust? So there are many questions here, and you can add many more, I suppose. But And now I think uh, my time is up, so I stopped talking. Thank you. OK, many thanks, Lars, for your great talk. Um, uh, 